Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's watching us online. The event's being live streamed. Uh, for those of us who are here for the first time, um, we're the Legatum Institute. We're an educational charity and a think tank. We largely focus on prosperity, what makes different countries and societies prosperous. But we also have a project dedicated to issues of development as it's uh, known. Uh, it's called the Transitions Forum, part of which is the Beyond Propaganda program. And before I start, I'd like to say thank you to the Legatum Foundation for their massive support in all our research and work. Um, we've been looking at different aspects of 21st century propaganda throughout the year. Um, today, we have a double session with some fantastic guests. Uh, we're going to look at how the internet has changed propaganda, and we're going to look at the question of conspiracies and whether we live in an age of conspiracies and whether that's undermining democracy. First, let me take you through some of our guests. Um, Katrina Elich is an uh, analyst with the US uh, Department of Defense. Uh, she's written a terrific paper for us about how the Maidan, the Ukrainian revolution, used the internet to really empower uh, dissidents to an almost uh, unheard of uh, extreme. Um, Sergei Popovich, um, who many of you I'm sure will know, is the author of Blueprint for Revolution, how to use rice pudding, Lego men, and other nonviolent techniques to overthrow dictators. Um, he was uh, the leader of the student movement that overthrew Milosevic, and has since then become sort of a, a consultant and guru to nonviolent revolutionary movements throughout the world, the Middle East and, and beyond. And finally, Charlie Winter, uh, who is just about to join Georgia State University in the US. We've only got a month of him left in London. Uh, he's going to be joining them as a senior associate in transnational conflict studies. Um, and he's really excelled uh, over the past six months as one of the you know, top analysts of ISIS propaganda, really, in the world. Um, he's absolutely required reading. And I'm very glad to have lured him into our little conspiracy and have him write an excellent paper for us. Um, so moving on, we're going to start off with this question of internet and um, propaganda. Naturally, um, sort of everything that we talk about is sort of, uh, sort of in the shadow of these terrible events in Paris. Um, and I think instead of sort of having a sort of amorphous discussion, I think we'll just cut straight to the chase. Have ISIS been using the internet for propaganda? What do we get wrong? And how can we be using the internet to push back against them? Um, Charlie, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about what's in your paper? I mean, I think everyone here knows uh, either directly or through sort of reports uh, reportage sort of the gruesome side of ISIS propaganda, these horrific um, execution videos. Um, uh, also, since, since what happened in Paris, we've seen sort of gloating. It's, 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 it's all really very disturbing. But, but one of the points you make, that's actually a very small percentage of what ISIS do in their online propaganda work. So give us a, a bigger picture. So the key thing about ISIS propaganda is it's not just directed at us in the international community. It's not just directed at potential recruits or adversaries. It's also incredibly focused on consolidating control in the caliphate itself. So in Iraq and Syria, there is a huge amount of content which doesn't look at violence or brutality. It has this utopian image, which is very, very important. So. Ooh. Should I try again? No, no, it's okay. I think you just move ahead and, and the sound will catch up with us. But within the, the corpus of Islamic State propaganda, the, the key thing, the most preponderant focus is upon this idea of utopia, on civilian life. And there's a great deal of narrative variation in it. And this is one of the five key things that makes ISIS propaganda so effective, so ubiquitous. The fact that it's not just looking at one audience, it's really uh, sought to appeal to as many people or scare as many people as possible. And these are not kind of mutually exclusive categories. They are much, much bigger than that. So there's a lot of crossover between the various strands of ISIS propaganda. But it creates a really comprehensive image of what it is to be a member of the group, what it is to not only fight for the group, but also live within its state. But so, I mean, 
I mean, it's something we've seen a lot from sort of some of the Kremlin's propaganda is that it, it changes its story uh, regard, you know, with regard to who it's talking to. So let's say I mean, we see sort of the, the sort of the, uh, the gruesome, very aggressive side of ISIS propaganda. So other sides are sort of, of almost fluffier or, or, or what, sort of, what sort of content do they produce? Fluffy is actually a really good way to describe some of it. I mean, there's a, a really big focus on streets being clean. That's kind of the standard stuff you see in a, an average day looking at ISIS propaganda. But you also get the really kind of idiosyncratic things, so birds being conserved or children having a day out at the zoo or at a fairground park. I mean, there are lots of things which you really wouldn't think a, a jihadi group would actually focus upon at all. But that's because we're not looking at the full picture. We, of course, there will always be a focus on the threats, the intimidation, the brutality. Those things are made for headlines, literally. But the things which are intended to appeal to people living within the region who aren't necessarily ideologically inclined, who aren't necessarily jihadists, but are looking for an alternative to the status quo, then that's where we have this idiosyncratic, civilian-focused <laughs> propaganda, be it videos, photos, or, or kind of magazines, that kind of thing too. So by the region, you mean people in sort of Iraq and Syria who are living in, sort of in, a, in a war and actually just want to know about clean streets. Um, now tell us, uh, most of your paper is dedicated to the current responses mm. that we've been trying to put out. So give us a couple of examples of what doesn't work. Um, I don't know, what have Western governments been trying to do which, which maybe wasn't uh, ideal? Well, I think that the role of Western governments in this is often kind of misinterpreted because people will see uh, a video being made or a, a kind of new Twitter handle that's been set up ostensibly to challenge ISIS. But then there's a lot of different ways that one can challenge ISIS. I think it's important to recognize that governments do have a role, but that role is more or less with clarifying policies or, or showing exactly what, what is happening in the, the fight against ISIS. Where governments do fall down, and the State Department probably is the most infamous example of this, is in a video called Welcome to ISIS Land, where it was essentially a montage of people being beheaded, people being stoned, shot, uh, really <coughs> gruesome stuff exactly the kind of stuff that ISIS wants us to be looking at. And it really won't have gone at all far in persuading people not to go, because if you're an ideologically inclined potential member of ISIS, you're looking to join the group, you agree with the jihad that it's waging, then this kind of violence is what you're going for. I mean, it's not the key driver, but this kind of violence isn't uh, the thing that's going to stop you from going. So we ended up basically doing their propaganda for them by, by saying how awful they were. Exactly, and if you're going by views on YouTube, it's the most successful counter-narrative video that there's been. <laughs> Don't know how many of those people will have been potential recruits there. But, uh, you know, across, what, g give us a bit of a map of what else is going on. I mean, what are governments trying to do? What are think tanks trying to do? Uh, what works, what doesn't? What's, what's, what's out there? So, loosely, you can break it down into four kind of sectors. So, at a government level, there's direct engagement. So, this is CSCC. This is uh, the, the, the Foreign Office has a, a big role in this as well. There's the Sawab Center, which is a US, UAE-based center, which is essentially set up to create counter content. And all of these things are working well. They're producing a lot of stuff, but not enough stuff. And I think it's important to recognize that in any of our efforts to, to, to try and meaningfully counter ISIS's propaganda machine, it's so vast. We need to really scale things up to a, a great degree. So when you have governments engaging directly and making counter content or engaging in campaigns, that kind of thing, that's all well and good, but there's the others. So there's technology companies, things like Facebook or Google um, or, or Twitter. All of them are engaging in their own way too, principally through funding research. So Google's funded a research paper into Twitter, which is quite strange, but there you go. Um, and then also Google has been funding a lot of stuff as well like the Against Violent Extremism Network, which wasn't set up with ISIS in mind, but it looks at those things. It tries to coordinate and, and join people up who have stories to tell that can really go a long way in creating counter-narratives. I mean, in your paper, the, the vast majority of attempts seem to be about using former jihadis to come and tell their stories, sort of, I was there, it was awful, sort of, sort of approach. That, that seems to be kind of like the dominant narrative strategy that we've chosen. It, um, how well is that working? Are there more innovative ones? Uh, um, I think you mentioned sort of di direct messaging at one point. Mm. So tell us a bit more about sort of how it actually, um, sort of, uh, so what are the actual narratives that are used? 
So the, the defector narrative is one which is often used, and it's, it's important. It works well with kind of trying to disengage people from violent extremism. But one thing which I think is a big issue is that we can't just counter ISIS propaganda with our own propaganda. It's really important also to engage in outreach in a similar way to ISIS as well. And this can be through one-to-one -one outreach, which uh, the think tank ISD is piloting at the moment, where people are identified if they're vulnerable online, and then they're engaged with directly. And I think that that's one of the key things here, that people aren't just being recruited to ISIS by watching propaganda. They're being recruited to ISIS by watching propaganda, but then having this kind of family. There's a, this weird thing called the Barkia family on Twitter, which is essentially this, this group of people who are very supportive of ISIS. And they go out looking for vulnerable individuals to bring them into the fold, bring them into the ISIS echo chamber. Once you're in the echo chamber, you obviously watch a lot of ISIS propaganda. You're exposed to it a lot. But it's more the interaction with other people in that echo chamber that leads to recruitment than just watching propaganda itself. So, so, did you, so the one-to-one -one, um, engagement, how does that work? So I'm sitting there. I've started sort of Facebooking or looking up stuff like, you know, how to you know, coordinate attack or how to move to ISIS. Hmm. And then what somebody direct messages me going, hey, I'm a former jihadi you know, don't do it, I did it. Is that, is that, is that, but is that what we're talking about, that kind of real person-to-person -person contact? It's the person-to-person -person contact which is so, so important. The fact that you have this uh, virtual collective, this virtual ISIS collective, uh, which does promise camaraderie, it promises friendship, it promises being part of something bigger. And I mean, I've spoken to a lot of former disseminators of, of ISIS propaganda, so the guys who uh, get tens of thousands of followers and spread pictures of people being beheaded, that kind of thing. And one of the key things that they always say is that they, were, they viewed themselves as diplomats for the caliphate. And they spoke about being part of something, being part of something big and great, and having this uh, friendship, this collective idea of doing something together. So that's one of the things that we need to recognize, that it's not just ISIS propaganda that we're countering. It's the entire ISIS outreach strategy. So one of the things that you just said, and I think you mentioned in your paper as well, is this idea that we need to take a leaf out of ISIS's book. What, do you, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I mean, when it comes to just the propaganda itself, we need to vary our narrative a lot more. We need to recognize that we're not just looking at one narrow audience of people who might want to join the group, but everyone. Everyone is watching at all times. So we need to think about audience differentiation as well. All the efforts that we've currently got need to be scaled up. We need to be thinking in terms of mainstreaming, countering ISIS's ideology and propaganda, rather than just leaving it to a select few third sector organizations or the government. And it's really focusing on scaling things up that needs to take place, alongside this countering the outreach as well. So recognizing that people join ISIS, not because they're necessarily nutters, but because ISIS promises them something that they're not getting elsewhere. So, I mean, the, the, the idea of the messenger is very important because you mentioned sort of governments are uh, uh, an, an untrusted messenger occasionally. Uh, think tanks also sort of coming from the outside, but you seem to be saying that this has to somehow be generated from the inside, from civic groups. Uh, I was at a, a meeting with some sort of NATO types recently who do the Stratcom for NATO. It's like the only thing we can do better than sort of authoritarian movements, either it's you know, governments or, or, or terrorist organizations, is that we've got civil society. We've got to somehow empower them. Now, you, Sergio, have written an absolutely fascinating paper. This one isn't for us. It was for the Fletcher School, um, about how one can empower civic groups to fight ISIS and how we can use, and this is where it kind of it made my sort of like head spin a little bit. You basically saying that you can, we can use the nonviolent revolutionary techniques that you've always focused on to fight ISIS. I mean, that seems very far-fetched. ISIS are so violent. H how can you use non-violence to confront them? Well, Milosevic was violent, and Pinochet was violent, and South African government was violent. And this is, in fact, the first uh, rule you use from a non-violent struggle book, is that you are not engaging your opponent at a position of strength, which is violence, but at a position of weakness. As you great <laughs> said, you want to look at their propaganda, it will discover their vulnerability. And the part of it is to discover what are the conditions that spawn groups like ISIS. And when you look at the parallels in the failed states like uh, Syria or Iraq, and you look at the Weimar Germany, you understand that the conditions were very similar. So what is this, spawn, this swamp that kind of spawns mosquitoes? So when you are fighting them on the military field, you are actually killing mosquitoes. 
But you know, if you kick the mosquitoes from here, they will spawn from somewhere else because there is no lack of failed states of this planet. And basically we're looking first at the conditions and then on the battlefield that you can, you can watch. The conditions are obvious. You have a vacuum of narrative, as you said. So there is no such thing as a female comic hero in our world. And there is a great guy whose video I will highly recommend, Suleiman Bakit, who think that just making a comic books and a videos that the kids will watch in school may alter what they consider cool. Because now they consider these people cool. And this is really dangerous because it expands the, the potential recruitment base. Second is, of course, the lack of delivery. Because when we were talking, we used to work with the groups from, from Syria that opposed uh, Assad nonviolently. And of course, they were the first one to be kicked out by ISIS because they were recognized by troublemakers. And they will tell you a really interesting story about how these guys may be evil, but everybody follows traffic regulations. Because before, nobody was following any law, and there was a lack of delivery. And now because these tough guys are in, remember Hitler once again, it's a different type of actor, but he means order. So because the people were living in a state of chaos, whoever promises them order, even if it, this is very violent, medieval type of Sharia order, is, you know, gaining some, some attentions. And then, of course, the third one is where they recruit. When you look at the Brussels, for example, you want to look at the lack of opportunity. Because if you are a Serb in this country or in Belgium, you will be Serb in fourth generation. And if you're in a Turk in Germany, and if you're a German in Germany with the same level of education, you don't have a similar treatment. And that's true for good old Europe. Sorry for saying this, I'm coming from Europe. And my brother is an immigrant in Italy, so I can tell this type of stuff. So one thing is to look at the conditions and try to tackle the conditions. So, you know, it's not enough just to bomb Iraq. You need to build in the system that works for these people or something else will happen. But looking at the, your question is exactly your point. It was like, uh, we are looking at the 35, 40,000 people we are trying to battle on the battlefield. What about 6 million people who are living there? What if these people wake up one morning and just decide they leave? There will be no Islamic State. What about these people wake up one morning and decide they are not paying the taxes? This is more than 40% of their revenue is coming from the people paying taxes. So as well as dictators, the extremist group need people to milk a cow, collect taxes, drive a bus, fix the public transportation. And what if people decide that they want to deny these services to their rulers? So looking at the very mobilization point of the nonviolent struggle, you want to look at the small acts of resistance, you want to look at the mobilization point, but as you said, you want to look across the spectrum of allies and understand what these people want. They want to maintain people there and attract more people there. So the main vulnerability and main possibility, in my point of view, is trying to find a way to mobilize normals or those who are in the middle of the political spectrum to act against the extremists. There is also a second reason why this propaganda doesn't work, because of course when you're looking at the propaganda, the very what the propaganda wants of you. What, what about the, the Marlboro billboard? They want you to go and buy Marlboro. What about the decapitation billboard? They want Marine Le Pen to win elections in France. So when you are working on their propaganda and talking about their propaganda, you're actually amplifying what they want. So what instead of that, we, we were discussing this example. I was recently in South Korea speaking with some North Koreans group that are smuggling a little USBs into the Hermit Kingdom. You know what's on these USBs? The messages of love. Because the people in that country are so brainwashed that everybody around the world hates them, that the most effective way to fight this propaganda is to have a Serb, Israeli, a Russian, whatever, sending a little message of love. We are here, the world is there for you, whatever they are selling you, it's crap. So thinking about in, along these lines may bring us to the idea how to mobilize people, how to build a counter-narrative, and how to work on selling this counter-narrative to the fact that the numbers are on our sides. We're talking about the 36,000 fighters, 6 million of people. If only we can mobilize the people who have left Syria to get involved into this type of struggle, we'll be having potentially two or three million recruits on the side of good in this story. And you quote a story about a woman in Raqqa, Raqqa. The, the capital of, of, of the caliphate, um, who launched a fairly unique type of protest, which seems to sort of give some 
credence to your ideas. Also very interested in this idea of, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they mean, flying protests? And what's the role mm. of the internet? Let's say we're battling someone like ISIS. How, how do you use the internet to, to achieve the aim? There, like, there are like two, two things we can, we can talk about. One where this uh, so-called hit and run demonstrations. Uh, we teach people how to work on nonviolent techniques. In, in fact, one of my students is in the audience here. And one of the first things you, you, you teach them is to put the risk bar low. So if you're doing something, you want to offer the people the lower risk bar for participation and you want to still get away with it. Of course, the more repressive the situation, like in, in, in Raqqa or in Syria, the more complicated it is to find this tactic. So this hit and run protest where you're waving a flag or a transparent, make a selfie and then share it on the Facebook, with a little time span to be caught, it's a very clever way of thinking about the dispersive tactic. Second thing, of course, uh, Catherine will speak more about it, there is a the power of the viral video. And it was very, very successful in Ukraine, in Venezuela, in Hong Kong, in many places. Very low-tech, low-budget type of thing. You want to look at the two, just type in mocking ISIS with videos in Google, and you will find tremendous examples of how the people were making a small videos that are, you know, mocking the very essence of the tough leaders who are actually drinking and listening to the music, but they pretend to be super conservative. You will find the Kurdish rock band or hip hop band or some awful mu I'm getting old. It was hillbilly. a rock. Yeah? A hillbilly, hillbilly band, a yes. Kurdish hillbilly band. Yes, but it's like the, when, when you're looking at how this works, this is exactly what you want to achieve. Instead of taking their message and amplifying it the way it can backfire on you, you want to take this narrative, mock this narrative, and do something tricky and witty and cool and low risk, survive, and then you're getting support for it. So it's a completely different approach than normal propaganda. Oh, they are evil. No, they are, they are, they are, they are ridiculous. They are so out of date. This is a different language when you're talking about it. And this works because it works on different audiences. It pisses them off and it makes people who are potential recruit think about them with a whole new set of, of, of sunglasses. Katrina, I mean, when I think about sort of this uh, vision that, that, that Charlie and Sergey have sort of like alluded to of like uh, civic actors getting together, to using the internet to overthrow um, a violent and malign ruler, uh, you know, I think two years ago, uh, it's exactly two years yeah. since the Maidan started, uh, the revolution in Ukraine, um, see, I thought that I was an expert. I thought I knew everything about the Maidan and the way sort of uh, the revolutionaries organized themselves. When I read your paper, I realized that I didn't know one millionth of it. <laughs> so um, it's almost like an encyclopedia of everything that activists could do um, when uh, fighting a, um, uh, a violent oppressor. Um, take us through all sure. the different things that we used. And I share your sentiment because as a U.S. Department of Defense analyst during the time of Euromaidan, we were so focused on events as they happened, we didn't actually have a time to step back and examine how social media was really changing the situation. I do have to preface that my comments are based entirely on my year of research uh, with Cambridge University. They don't reflect the Department of Defense of the U.S. government. But that being said, um, beyond mobilization, you know, Facebook invites and so forth, I was really intrigued from the defense perspective of how social media was really being used as a tactical or operational tool to strengthen and sustain an anti-government movement. So I started by examining um, online social networks that arose during the time of Euromaidan, this very week as, as uh, Peter pointed out. And first looking at the online content but then gravitating toward, in toward interviews. And I based it on functional um, strengths that I thought would be useful in, in basically sustaining a movement. So everything from marketing to intelligence sharing to actually a self-defense <coughs> force to logistic networks, medical care, et cetera. All of these capabilities um, that the Euromaidan was able to provide self-organized on the ground. And um, I was actually just absolutely blown away at how much social media became an integral part of this movement. And even backing up to the very foundation. It was a, a Facebook post that in, initially brought people to the Maidan in protest and then of course people started reacting to police violence. But social media had an integral part from the very beginning and throughout the movement's development. Um, the fact that all of these capabilities developed after a triggering event, uh, the November 21st 
uh, Yanukovych announcement of suspension of the EU association agreement, and then the 30 November uh, police violence against uh, people on the Maidan. The fact that all of these capabilities developed after triggering events um, demonstrated that while social media may not determine where, when, or whether a population will support a cause and mass, it will crucially develop, uh, determine how it develops. And on the flip side, of course, governments, particularly anti-authoritarian uh, regimes, are, are learning this and uh, learning very quickly how to harness social media. Um, but a couple key points before I get into comment, kind of some of the points I want to raise on the functional aspects of social media in Euromaidan. Um, I think it's important to highlight the fact that Euromaidan was really special for the Ukrainian people in the sense that unlike the Ukrainian uh, 2004 Orange Revolution, Euromaidan arose almost anonymously. No one individual or party or uh, entity was credited with its birth, and that maintained an importance throughout the movement's development. And the piece that I was most interested in was that this was a movement sustained by online networking operating not around one hub, but multiple hubs based on functions and needs. And I think that that's kind of where we are as a society as well, which is why social media is so integral. It's how we communicate, how we, how we, determine, how we find things that we need. It's just becoming normal. But what two years ago Ukrainians showed was that this, this is the new normal. Um, so just a few points that I, I found absolutely fascinating in my research of these, um, these activists. And I have to say first, most of the organizers I spoke to had no social media background whatsoever. They learned on the fly. They saw a need. They wanted to do something for their government, or, or, or not, sorry, not, not their government, their, their people. And a lot of them were really reacting against police violence. They wanted to do something. So first and foremost, marketing and branding the movement was absolutely critical in getting out the word of what Euromaidan was. What did it mean? Uh, there were a lot of different efforts from a blogger who maintained a, a Twitter feed constantly updated uh, called Ukrainian Updates in English so that it reached a wider foreign audience. There was a, a digital Maidan effort that uh, did recurrent Twitter storms that in one week alone reached three million people worldwide with the Euromaidan hashtag. Um, other efforts um, bringing rapid translation capabilities to the movement. Um, and then, of course, we saw the swelling of on, uh, online, independent, and real-time uh, independent um, TV, like Hromadska TV, operating off of YouTube and other social media platforms. Very powerful, um, particularly for people who are used to not necessarily having a voice. Uh, for the self-defense forces, one of the most powerful aspects was just purely the ability to share tactical, real-time information on everything from interior troop movements to YouTube videos on how to make a Molotov cocktail or what to do if react if you're tear gassed. Uh, that kind of very useful tactical information on the ground real time was extremely powerful. And what I was particularly impressed by was just purely the logistic networks that arose online. One was called uh, the Logistics Headquarters, which really became that everything from providing shelter, they arranged a shelter for around 20,000 people during Euromaidan. Uh, from donations to uh, medical supplies and so forth. Um, and they also operated a 24-7 virtual call center, which was maintained by people, well, both in Ukraine but also abroad. So that ability to reach globally anybody who was supporting the Euromaidan really expanded the idea of what is an activist um, and made this very powerful. Uh, we haven't really mentioned anonymous yet, but I think Anonymous has gained, gained a lot of headlines recently by targeting ISIS, declaring war on ISIS. Anonymous was also very active during Euromaidan. Um, this internet gathering may be difficult to task, but when it comes to freedom of spe speech, censorship, they often take a keen interest, and that was no different in the Arab Spring and Euromaidan. They were also very active. <coughs> and they use social media frequently to communicate with activists on the ground to get a sense of who to target sense of what, what is actually happening on the streets, and also to, to of course, advertise their um, hacking uh, activities against the state. But anonymous is, is always going to be a key feature, I think, uh, this, uh, well, Arab Spring showed that, and then henceforth, of any mass people's movement. And they will particularly use social media to advertise uh, what they're working. 
Um, What's interesting is, is during Euromaidan, Anonymous actually said that they were becoming a target of the FSB, of the Russian FSB. They said that, um, and I, I saw this as well as I was researching some of their materials, is that there were actually faked Anonymous YouTube videos circulating. So you couldn't really tell what was anonymous and what wasn't, and that's part of the difficulty of having something that's anonymous. You can't really trace exactly the origin. Um, you would have to know the specifics or the context of the situation. So I, you know, I knew that Anonymous wasn't really advocating pro-Kremlin bent, but you wouldn't necessarily know that by uh, seeing some of the faked footage that was circulating. <coughs> and just very briefly, because I'm sure we'll, we're running out of time, but I want to hit really quickly on the anti-Maidan side of things. Um, coming into it, I guess I had the, the view that there was probably not very much happening on the anti-Maidan side of the house and social media. Uh, the Yanukovych regime really preferred the, the old school traditional types of repression, um, which, which was true, but there was also actually after the mid-January riots, there was an explosion um, of anti-Maidan networks suddenly in social media, particularly in the contact and most noticeably targeting populations outside of Kiev, so in Crimea and the Donbass and so forth, where you would predict. Um, but it was interesting to see this sudden like wake-up call that they needed to get active in social media. And most of these networks continue today. They're actually more active now than they were during Maidan, even though they're all called anti-Maidan, um, uh, Donetsk, for instance. Just 10% of the posts, actually, I found were uh, actually occurred during Maidan. All of them have been very prolific in mostly um, creating and disseminating propaganda, again, faked messages, <coughs> faked videos, and so forth. So this is a very uh, pro-Kremlin group of networks that continue on. Okay, going back to the Maidan, I mean, one thing that really struck him was the social services. So it wasn't just like, I knew the agitational stuff, the Molotov cocktails, because I'd see that in London and I'd learn how to make a Molotov cocktail as well. Um, <laughs> But what's amazing is sort of like medical supplies, hospitals, legal right. advice. Because you talk about one of ISIS's Achilles, well, one of ISIS sort of pitches is that you know, we can provide better social services. And it shows to what extent sort of activists that they were to get engaged could actually just, just fight on the social services front. I find that remarkable. We're going to take a few questions now. We're then having a small wine and uh, Luke Said break. And then we're back in for conspiracy. I can imagine that, especially with ISIS questions, there might be questions that go on. You'll get the chance to, you know, I don't mind if questions carry on from this panel onto the next panel. So if you don't get a chance now, you'll get a chance later. One thing is, you have to stand when you ask a question, you have to take a microphone, and you have to say who you are and where you're from. Because it's for our online audience, so they don't lose their way. Uh, I think there's, there's one here, there's a... There's a microphone right behind you if you turn around and do a, a somersault. It's in front of you, behind you. Which way I should turn around? Uh, I'm Ian Mordant. I'm an independent researcher. I, I worry in relation to ISIS, the use of the word Islamist, talking about this Islamist organization. Every second word, Prime Minister says, Islamist extremism. Isn't that playing into it? And also, I'm, okay, you agree, and also I think about in relation to getting people to do what is called de-radicalization. You've got to have people who are, what I'm going to call urban Muslims, doing the work, a lot of it. Uh, and again, that's, and they're going to have to say, come on, this is not us, which indeed it isn't them. But if we keep using the word Islamist, they get locked up in it. And we should get off that word. I'd use the word, how about talking about pre-urban outlooks? Pre-urban, that's, that's, we have a whole um, season here about uh, uh, urbanism. Um, I think we'll take a few questions and then, and then move it on. Suburban. She says suburban. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm David Webster from the Indus Group. A couple of remarks. One in regard to um, Anonymous. One of the things that they've been doing recently, of course, is taking down Twitter accounts, etc. I suppose the downside of that is you are also degrading some of this open source intelligence, which we've seen has been so useful in things like Bellingcat. And I wonder sort of how you, uh, if you've got any remarks about that. Secondly, in regard to ISIS, clearly we want them gone, but in undermining them, 
what's the sense of presenting an alternative? Because I suspect that for many of the Sunnis, it is a case of being caught between Hitler and Stalin almost, of ISIS on one side and the, the Shia militias on the other. I think we can start answering. Oh, uh, Anne, do you, do you want to? Yeah, we'll, have, we'll take one more. We can handle four. So far we've got Islamists, should we call them that? Anonymous, their role, and the establishment of an alternative. Institute. I have a question because uh, about the efficacy of social media in creating mass <coughs> movements. Because I've seen a lot of different version, a lot of different arguments about it. One is the one that you just made, which is that it can galvanize people. Um, but there are a number of examples I I know of where it doesn't. It seems to galvanize people because it's very easy to like something on Facebook, but it, then it doesn't necessarily translate into real action or real activity, mm. let alone real government or real change. Can you talk a little bit about what makes an online movement work and doesn't? Any, any of the three of you? Yeah, I think we'll, st we'll start with that because that's such a fundamental question. Ivan Krastev, uh, my favorite Bulgarian philosopher, the only one I know, uh, recently had a huge New York Times op-ed about it, the failure of the Twitter revolutions. Uh, all these, and you've talked about this a lot, why, how the Arab Spring crested and then didn't come to fruition. Yeah. So why don't we start with that and then we'll get into the other ones. Sort of mm -hmm. sub well, I, I think it's a great question and I think we need to we do a lot of research on this. And I think it's a, the use of new media in, in social movements is a two-sided coin. There are at least three things which they brought completely new to the battlefield and arena. EA, mobilization is faster, cheaper and safer because otherwise you need to do leaflets and radio commercials and knock doors and stuff like that. Now you make a Facebook group, everybody's there. Second, uh, it provides a, a level of a price tag. So, you know, Assad's father could slaughter 20,000 people in the 70s, get away with it only because he expelled the foreign media. Now everybody is a reporter and whatever happens, you know, it goes straight to the web. That's nice. Third and very important, we are now experimenting with it. This is the online learning. And I think this is the latest achievement is that the activists are learning from the activists horizontally. This is very important. This is a completely new phenomenon in my world. I'm super excited about finding how, to, how, how this works more. Boom, somebody makes a viral video in Venezuela called I am a vet, like what's wrong in Venezuela in a nutshell? Three million views. Somebody copy pasted from Ukraine. I'm a Ukrainian, five million views. Now, activists can learn from activists. They, they, they are not only capable of downloading book or attending the course. We are recently experimenting with a Harvard course on teaching people how to organize the movement across the world online to see if these skills can be shared. And, but we also need to look at the downsides. First is the phenomenon we, Anne mentioned, we like to call collectivism. How many of you are remembering Connie 2012? How many of you liked Connie 2012? Where is Connie in 2015? <laughs> so we all know where he is. So, I mean, uh, without further discussion, how many polar bears have you saved this morning by clicking on the cause of the Facebook? 13, 15? But you didn't turn off the light. And that's the point. Like, the struggles are happening in the real world. And when you look at the successful online campaigns, as opposed to unsuccessful online campaigns, the difference is where they make difference in the real world. So the reason why this bucket challenge is powerful is because you do something, you give the personal example, but then you challenge the people you know in the real world to do the same and donate. So the moment it can transfer in the real world, it gets out of the zone of collectivism and gets into the zone of movement. Uh, second, the bad guys are learning. Putin has a factory of trolls exposed in your marvelous Guardian article I'm so proud of. And you know you have, <laughs> and you probably get the worst number of evil comments about this once you publish it, because there is an army of trolls waiting for you to troll you. This is what they do. And of course they learn how to, the first thing they, they do when they arrest you in Iran, they extract your, your Facebook and, and social network uh, uh, kind of passwords, because this is how they can lure people in. Now it's your profile talking to your friends. And last but not the least importance, this phenomenon we call occupyism. Only because it's so easy to assemble people via social network, people tend to repeat this mantra. Look at what they're doing. They're looking at the, at the Tahrir and they say, wow, all we need to do is sit on a symbolic public place for as long as possible and M&M chocolates will start falling from the sky. And they repeat it in, in Wall Street. <laughs> and then they sit there forever and then they repeat it in Hong Kong. So reaching numbers and focusing on tactics of concentration is the one of the lures that comes with the social media. 
in what we are teaching, assembling numbers before you're capable of controlling numbers is as dangerous as not being capable of assembling numbers to, 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 to there at all. And sticking to this high risk, high main maintenance tactics like occupation, only because it's so easy to assemble numbers, is, is what, in my opinion, killed the Hong Kong movement. So it's like, you're very right, it comes with a good side, but it also comes with a downside. So explain that, why did that kill it? Just because I'm, I'm a bit slow. So, so why, what, they, they got all the numbers together, they didn't know what to do with them. They, no, they, they got through the first step. You never, the like the, 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 the theory of nonviolent struggle we teach said you need to build numbers. But building numbers gradually through the small victories, A, builds your authority, B, builds your skills, C, builds your organization. Instead of that, if you say, let's occupy the place, you bring 10,000 people, and then what? And then what if mainland China doesn't give you democracy tomorrow? And what you're going to do the next week? And what you're going to do the next month? And then you're getting into Maidan dilemma. When the numbers start dwindling, then the potentially violent groups take over. And they can take the message of, of your own movement. So playing with this, it's really like the, the social media are a very useful tool for mobilization of the movement. But as long as you see it as a tool. The moment you think the battle is virtually won, or lost, you're missing the point. What should we call Islamists? That was the first question. Uh, that's, that's very difficult for me to say, but it's a lot about the branding and how do do, do want to play their branding. I think it's more a question yeah, Charlie, for you, but you, the question yeah. of alternative, I think alternative narrative is very important. And this is what we were missing all over the Arab Spring. It was easy for Serbs or Poles or Czechs to deal with what we want to achieve because we had Europe to look at and say, okay, this is the system of values more or less into which we want to look. There was nobody thinking about developing this type of alternative vision for a Muslim world. We somehow expected that just because we are super happy with this model, it can be exported in the Arab world. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's indigenous task to build this vision. And it's a task of the people there to say, what is the alternative to the caliphate? We can only help them with tools. Yeah, the Islamist question. What do you, what, what, this, this, this branding question. What? Um, well, I think it's important to call a spade a spade. Um, I'd say that Islamic State is an Islamist movement. It's a violent Islamist movement. You could also call them jihadists, but they don't really... Uh, the question of playing into their hands by calling them Islamist is kind of like the question of whether we should say that they're not Islamic. That's something which regularly comes out in, in uh, political rhetoric. But I think that really ISIS thrives on these notions of whether it's Islamic or not, whether it should be called Islamist, Islamic, or, or whatever. It really likes to have the challenge of saying, actually, no, we are Islamic, and you guys don't know your stuff. So that's kind of a, it's a difficult territory to get into, because at the same time as, as uh, calling a spade a spade, there is a risk of it being misinterpreted by people. But I think it's really important, too, in this case. I think it's, it's critical that we don't understand Islamic State for something that it's not. Uh, and it does have uh, Islamist ambitions. It wants Sharia law, it wants to establish a caliphate, and it believes in waging violent jihad to establish all of that. So I think we need to, uh, to kind of stick with that. Just on the question of alternatives, I had this um, really interesting story um, from back in May, just before Palmyra was taken over. Uh, sorry, just after Palmyra was taken over. Uh, and it, it directly lines up with why we need to have an indigenous alternative uh, to this whole situation. We can't just focus on imposing a solution from outside. So I was speaking to someone who, she and her family were from Palmyra, and she was saying that uh, her family were actually annoyed that they left Palmyra when they did. They left back in March when Assad was still bombing it. And they left because Assad was still bombing it. But she said to me that if ISIS had taken over earlier, then they would have stayed. Not because they are jihadists, but because the life that they had under Assad was unbearable. And if they are Sunni Muslims who toe the line uh, in Palmyra, and they don't uh, kind of break out of ISIS's binary worldview, then they can, they can get by. And there's this very kind of understandable uh, focus on the fact that ISIS is very, very brutal, hideously violent, and unacceptable. But one thing that we don't look at is the fact that people living in the region, they don't necessarily see it like that. They have been living in a context of civil war or warlordism or systemic persecution for many, many years now. And if a group comes along and says, actually, you know what, we're going to defend you as long as you do what we say, that's a very powerful thing, a very 
uh, intoxicating argument that, that can actually make people who aren't ideological supporters of jihad think that this could be the least worst option.